Show of hands, who knows what Modlishka is? Just curious. Uh, it is it, loosely translated from Polish. It is uh, the same as Mantis. Uh, and, uh, well, we'll start there. So just real quickly about me, as Laura mentioned, I'm, I work at Merck uh, because apparently I have a ton of spare time. I'm also an adjunct member of the faculty at UNC Charlotte. Uh, I'm also a board member of ID Pro. And I also joined up this year to become an election precinct official, which is going to be an interesting world. I haven't even done my training yet, but uh, I'm excited because it's going to help secure our elections, at least where I live. So if you want that benefit, you'd have to come to where I live. So. Uh, just as a general disclaimer, hopefully everybody knows this by now, but the opinions expressed here are my own, and you can find me on Twitter. Uh, that lovely gal uh, standing next to me is my horse, Freckles, and we have a little bit of a story about her in a moment. But first, there's a horse story, but prior to that, and this is my pony, just for Laura, because yes, you too can have a pony. They're not cheap, though. Um, but this isn't actually a story about a pony. It's a story about a gate. The original, my origin as a speaker on this circuit uh, started with a story about this little girl and um, that gate and my inability to secure that gate, which led to a mischievous adventure, which and luckily nobody got hurt. And I kind of thought this horse story thing was probably going to play its course. And then I got back from Germany and this lovely lady gave me a new inspiration. Basically what happened about a day and a half after I had kind of recovered from my jet lag, I decided to get in the ring and I was gonna go for a little bit of a ride. But first, I always try and warm up my horse. And especially over the past year, the weather in Charlotte's been really bad. So just wanted to get her nice and loose. And uh, started playing with her on the ground and just really just asking her to move around. And while doing so, I applied what we call a little bit of pressure, just to say I'd like you to pick up your gait and move a little bit faster. And as you can see where the boards are here, um, there's a gate right next to it. And she, after I applied this pressure, gave me some feedback. And it was in the form of, I'd rather not. Now, what really frightened me in this scenario, and the gate is not in the, uh, I didn't take this at the time that it happened, although the tongue sticking out may have been appropriate. Um, she literally jumped through that gate and scared the bejesus out of me because she started limping as soon as she cleared it and I thought, my horse has just broken her leg. And I get into this, this emotional panic state of, oh my God, what do I, you know, I check her out pretty quickly, she's okay. I was like, wow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that was kind of what my heart did when she did that. Um, so she's okay, but I immediately begin having this, all right, how the hell do I keep this from happening? Because obviously I already had this happen with Pony, and now I've got Freckles doing something, so I'm thinking something along the lines of this. <laughs> You're just not getting through that section of fence. Now this might be a little expensive, um, but I was willing to pay that price. But that was the emotions talking, and that was the initial panic that we experienced as we went through that. But then my professorial hat came in, and the number one rule of software design is the first thing you do, and everybody should be able to repeat this, you understand the problem. The problem here wasn't that I had a fence there that my ho horse jumped over. She's, I mean, she's a great horse. She's not that athletic. As it turned out, the gate had a gap about this big that I could not see. And so she saw that gap and took it as that's my opportunity. She jumped through it. So as soon as I discovered that, I'm exhaling a little bit more, the pulse rate's going down, and things are getting a little bit better. So the panic calms down. So what we really come to is, rather than saying we even understand the problem, let's understand the risk. What was the risk of my horse going through that at the time? At the time, I didn't know. But if I had properly closed the gate, the risk really wasn't there. So you don't actually need the wall. Some security vendors might have sold me something differently, to be fair. Um, but what it really turned out to was, just needed to attach that. Problem solved. 
what does this have to do with Modlishka, a praying mantis, and uh, two-factor? I haven't done that, and it's a very poor job of my introduction. Uh, the short answer is, first of all, when it comes to thinking about panicking, your risk should really define what your response is going to be. Um, and unless you come to understand that risk, and the final question in Nishant's talk was actually a nice setup for that, is you should actually understand the risk of what's taking place before you make any decisions. Let the panic fade, and then you start making some of those decisions. So when we come back to this, for those that aren't familiar with Modlishka, and I'll do a little bit more of a detail on this in a moment, this was a penetration tool re uh, released by a Polish researcher named Piotr, and I cannot get his last name, but uh, it was designed to be a penetration tool, penetrating testing tool. But naturally, he released it as open source, which immediately goes to the hackers, right? But what made this particular tool kind of interesting is it was a reverse proxy that would allow penetration testers to very quickly set up phishing sites um, to attempt to fish users. Naturally, everybody was very calm about this and decided, hey, let's take a, look, a closer look at this uh, before we make any rash decisions. I'm kidding, of course. Everybody panicked. My response is, I happen to like Neil Patrick Harris. What can I say? <laughs> Once the panic kind of faded, we realized, because if you look at any security professional that looks at conventional two-factor authentication methods, and they tell you, you could fish someone's one-time password in a two-factor authentication pattern, everybody would go, yeah, people have been able to do that for years. So why is this all of a sudden a new thing? Well, the honest answer is, it isn't. However, our panic level immediately went to 10 as soon as this came out. And when I say our panic level, some of it was security researchers. A lot of it, frankly, was uh, security journalists who, to be fair, they're trying to get clicks. You know, so you wind up with some headlines that you know, don't look the greatest. So when we start talking about this problem, we're going to go through three sections. The first one is I'm going to introduce a new term. I think it's new. I Googled it. It doesn't exist. Uh, I call it security panic theater. It's kind of a deviation on fear, uncertainty, and doubt, but I like this one better, and I'll explain why. And then we'll talk about the current state of two-factor. The good news is I'm not going to be repeating a lot of what Nishant said, uh, maybe playing on it a little bit. And then finally, what do we do about this? What, how do we make decisions that surround this? Um, and as you probably guessed, some of that is we need to filter that through the lens of LISC. Lens of LISC. That sounded really good. Let's try the lens of risk instead. Um, which we don't always do well as identity professionals. Our job is to kind of connect people and make things happen. Security is certainly a focus for that. So let's look at security panic theater. First off, who knows what security theater is? Just curious. A handful of people. So we'll describe it a little bit. If you've been through TSA to get here, you have experienced security theater. Everybody, I mean, you can see this massive line. You take off your shoes, you go through all kind of contortions, you take off your belt. If you have fluid ounces that are exceeding three, you have to throw them away. You get the idea. I have a small problem with that. And I will be reading this. If you bring too much liquid, the TSA confiscates it and throws it away in case it's a bomb. So they throw it away in case it's a bomb. <laughs> in the garbage can right next to them with all the other possible bombs in the area with the most amount of people in case it's a bomb. <laughs> so you can see where my opinion of, of security theater is. Well, security panic theater is kind of the opposite of this. What we're looking to do in this scenario is eliminate going to that 10 on the panic meter. So when Malishka came out, this article within days came out. Has two-factor authentication been defeated? First of all, is that even possible? I mean, after just watching Nishant's talk, obviously when we talk two-factor authentication, we're talking a lot of different things. So unless you're Thanos, you're probably not snapping your fingers and killing every single one of them. See, I got an MCU reference then. So, but really what we're trying to avoid is this, the number 10. When we get an announcement of a vulnerability, instead of immediately getting our hair on fire, 
And don't get me wrong, there may be instances in which having your hair on fire is justified. I can say factually, two years ago, when my company got hit by not pet ya, hair on fire was pretty justified. We had 17,000 Windows servers nuked in 90 seconds. That was a time to panic, somewhat. Obviously, we needed to do some things. But generally, you need to understand what's happening before you really make that reaction. And obviously, this wasn't with respect to two-factor. So pretty briefly, I'd like to go through a little bit of a historical view of some of the vulnerabilities that we've seen in two-factor authentication over time. And oddly enough, the last three have happened within the last six months. So this kind of gives you a sense of how the technology landscape evolves so quickly. And we'll take a look at each of them. First, about uh, seven years ago, some security researchers announced that they had hacked RSA's strongest security key. They announced that using a variety of methods, they were able to, first of all, you had to physically have access to the device. It had to be plugged in and you had to have the pin, and by doing that, you could extract both the public and private keys that were on the device. That was the claim. Needless to say, RSA differed in their opinion of that. Uh, I actually had to go through archive.org, so if you ever get a chance to donate to archive.org, it's not a bad idea, because sometimes those articles disappear. But obviously, RSA responded to this and said, look, this is not new. Uh, it requires some methods that are suspect, and by the way, uh, it's actually false. You cannot extract the keys even if you had the pin. So at least there's some discussion there. But again, if you're a customer and you see that and your entire workforce uses these smart cards, you're in hair on fire mode, right? That's what we want to, that's what we want to avoid. When we start talking about SS7, just show of hands, who knows what SS7 is? Probably a smaller range of hands. Um, it's a wireless communication protocol. Uh, it's basically carried over all of our cell networks. Uh, and it is how your SMS messages are delivered in most networks. Uh, and I am not an expert on uh, SS7, so uh, if I get parts of that wrong, let me know. But the challenge with it was, from a two-factor authentication perspective, if an attacker were on your network node, they had hacked into that node, and were able to listen on, on that protocol, not only could they get your SMS code, but they could also listen in on your wireless communications but it required that you actually be physically hacked into that node. So again, applying that risk filter, it's problematic, but do you throw away two-factor authentication because this exists? I would argue probably not. This one happened pretty recently, um, and I was a big fan of what NIST did in terms of the revisions that they made to the 863 standard. Hopefully you've seen some of the sessions here earlier on that. But one of the pieces that came out of one part of the section was they recommended that SMS two-factor authentication be deprecated as a standard. And again, hair on fire ensued. Um, and, and it wasn't just the security journalists. Everybody was, you know, have, and some people were like, yes! But a lot of people are like, this is a pretty common method of two-factor. Not that it's completely without its vulnerabilities, but ultimately what wound up happening was NIST had to release a blog post explaining, look, we're not killing SMS as a two-factor method. It has some legitimate use cases. Um, and my friend John Fontana posted a pretty good post that said, oh, hold on there and kill the two-factor authentication market because again, this isn't the entirety of the market either. So again, we, we, we get that panic meter back down to maybe a two or a three instead of being at 10. And then the most recent ones, Google is very proud of what they did in the Beyond Trust initiative, and they rightfully should be, but they had an issue come up with the Titan security keys that have a Bluetooth functionality on them. It was a bug, they announced it, there's a recall, but again, that panic ensues because even the, the gold standard of two-factor authentication all of a sudden has a vulnerability. <sighs> Do we just give this up now? Of course not. You do the recall, you get the code fix, and, and you keep going. And then finally, and this is my favorite security panic theater example, uh, YubiKey recently had an issue with their uh, FIPS version of their Series 5 keys. And it was a really interesting bug because it actually required that um, the key be in a very specific state 
in order for you to be able to compromise their encryption keys. Uh, and even the simple act of registering your key and inserting it into your device where your system would recognize it would actually mitigate that flaw. So it wasn't really a high risk scenario, but again, we went to 10. And the register has, in my opinion, the perfect example of security panic theater, um, you know, oh for FIP's sake. And obviously, they're replacing the keys again. Panic is not justified. So again, let's stop. So with that in mind and that history context, and I thought Andrew Nash also provided a good context if you happen to watch his keynote uh, yesterday, giving you a historical perspective of where cryptography has, get, uh, has gone and where um, identity has gone historically. And I think it's instructive with respect to the two-factor landscape as well. So we're gonna take a look at a number of different methods here. First thing I would recommend is that we take off the two. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But Nishant's gone through some of this, but for those that weren't here, these are very general categories. They are not specific, uh, and they may not even be complete. Uh, I will own that, because I haven't, I'm not Gartner, I don't have time to do a full survey of the marketplace. But I think this gives you a good sense of what the landscape looks like. Obviously what we know, your password, your pens, what you have, that's a big list because that seems to be where the market is coalescing. Uh, and that's okay. And then we get into the biometrics and I've added behavioral biometrics under the, the R piece. Some people have made the case that this is actually a fourth factor of authentication. I think Nishant makes a compelling case that it's not actually a factor of authentication. It may be a supporting factor for continuous authentication use cases. And I think that's a pretty good case. Um, I do include FIDO2 in both of these because the authenticators in FIDO2 can be both biometric and non-biometric. So just in case you're wondering why they're in both columns. But this gives you a good sense of hopefully why you can't say somebody just killed 2FA. You know, which one? Um, now I will note here, and this is, probably isn't completely complete, but each of the ones that I highlighted here in orange are ones that have very known vulnerabilities. Does it mean you don't do them? Depends on what your risk is. And that's the central question. So what do we do? Well, we know what we don't do, right? I'm not gonna do it again. Um, but one of the questions we do need to ask is how effective is two-factor authentication? Because you'll see articles about that as well. It's people spelling the doom of 2FA. And there's been a number of studies on, on this subject, and I'd like to highlight a couple of them. Um, Javelin recently released uh, a report that was sponsored by FIDO on the state of uh, strong authentication. And a couple of numbers that stood out. Um, one was for consumers, there were basically the uh, rate of adoption for consumers went up about threefold. And I think Nishant was correct. I think PSD2 was probably the biggest driver behind that. Um, a 50% increase for enterprises. I will say personally at Merck, we've adopted two-factor internally, um, which is not a super common use case for a lot of companies. One of the biggest reasons was obviously because we got attacked, but also because the language that you keep hearing about zero trust, the perimeter's gone, you know, insert your metaphor here. But when a user's logging in, you need to look at their risk and challenge them appropriately. Now, a key data gap here is when most companies are examining the effectiveness of two-factor authentication, um, they don't talk about what the account takeover rate is when two-factor is enabled. And I think that's a data point that's missing. There'd be a for, pretty fertile ground for research. Now, that being said, Google does take a stab at studying this, specific obviously to Google. So you have to kind of take, I'm not gonna say with a grain of salt, but you just have to filter that through their knowledge. But their findings were pretty interesting. Um, for device-based challenges, um, for both automated and bulk phishing attacks, they were 100% effective at preventing them and 90% effective at, at preventing a targeted attack. So that type of a device prompt is you're logging into your Google account and you have the Google app on your phone, it'll send you a push prompt saying, hey, is this you? That's pretty effective. But what I thought was really surprising was even just using the SMS code, as much as SMS gets just absolutely pummeled, 
Automated attacks, it was 100%. Bulk phishing attacks, it was 96%. That's still pretty darn good. And even for target attacks, you got 76%. And I'm not going to go through each of these, but obviously they're a big fan of the security keys because you see where the numbers are on that. So even adopting that simple measure, even if you were just doing SMS, you get a pretty high efficacy rate in terms of preventing account takeovers. And again, I think there's a lot more study that needs to be done on this. Uh, as Nishant highlighted with the University of Indiana study, the adoption rate is still abysmally low in the consumer space. So we have to figure out how, from a UX perspective, we improve that. So we're not there completely. Overall, how effective is 2FA? There was a good article in PC Mag. Basically said, you're a fool not to be deploying 2FA in a consumer space at some measure because it's still very effective against most targeted attacks. It's just a good hygiene practice. The key takeaway is no matter how much we innovate in the technology space, te attackers will always find a way. Sarah talked about behavioral economics or macroeconomics in her keynote. When you make the changes on one side in terms of improving your defense, your attackers are going to look for other ways to attack. That's going to be a give and take until the end of time. The good news is that's job security. <laughs> So we have to deal with that dynamic. So what do we do in response to that? Well, we talked about risk. Let risk be your guide in terms of choosing the method of 2FA. Don't necessarily lock yourself into a single method depending upon what your business needs are. And that's, you know, Nishant was answering a question at, at the end of the, the talk. And very much, you know, you have to filter it through that lens and have a much broader discussion. If you have a good risk practice at your company, have a good, robust conversation with them on how you measure what that risk looks like. And as the vulnerabilities emerge, I'm going to borrow Vanilla Ice. And first, I told you it wasn't going to happen, but it did. Stop, collaborate by working with ID Pro and collaborating in ID Pro. You see what I did there? Yeah. And research. You thought I was going to say listen, didn't you? <laughs> Do your research, and that research can be through ID Pro. It can be talking to research companies that you work with or doing your own research. I guarantee you, when NotPetya you hit, I had a lot of time on my hands. Guess what I was doing? I was researching NotPetya. I discovered what Mimi Katz was and why I hate the guy who developed it. Um, hate, respect, you know, it's, it's a fine line. Um, tomato, tomato. But that's what you should be doing as an individual, because one of the things that happened, like when the Yubico uh, announcement came out about FIPS, I had five emails in my inbox going, do we have to replace all of our Yubi keys? I was like, no, we don't use FIPS. <laughs> um, but I had to explain that, and I had to do so both in business language and technical language. Um, because obviously they saw it as a threat, but I was able to disable the panic pretty quickly. And I think we can do that as professionals as well. That's one of the great things with ID Pro, shameless plug here is when vulnerabilities have come out, the robustness of the discussions is off the charts. People are in there talking about what vendors might be impacted. They'll link to official vendor statements on this. So when something like that happens, that's where a collaboration community like that can really benefit. So where do we go from here? I mentioned the first two. Technology will always gain vulnerabilities. History shows this. For enterprise, I would encourage you to embrace two-factor in some fashion internally uh, for now, and I say for now uh, for a reason. For consumers, add 2FA where you can. So if you are in a CIM scenario, make that an offering and create solid recovery alternatives. One of the biggest weaknesses in two-factor right now is account recovery, as has already been discussed. And finally, let's consider this idea. Let's kill the two in 2FA. What that requires, we have to kill the passwords first. But if we kill the passwords like that, hasn't happened like that over time, right? But if we do that, then we get authenticators or credentials in our ecosystem that are strong enough that can serve as primary methods of authentication. And then we add additional authenticators in that ecosystem so that I left my phone at home, but my iPad's still with me, I can still authenticate. 
I think we're innovating in that space that will make that happen. I think there's a talk occurring immediately after this that may talk to some of those concepts. But I think that's where we can go. I'm not saying let's kill 2FA right now. But I think we're headed in that direction, and I think that's a good thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've got a couple of minutes for questions, comments, con concerns, yes, sir. catastrophes. You said use uh, TFA internally for now. What, were you, what, what was the lead in there? Uh, the lead in was I think we can get to a primary method. In other words, once we get rid of the password, uh, I, I think we can get to a single method and hopefully a continuous method. 